Greetings! In today's video, I will be screwing around with my suspension, nearly melting my tank with a heat gun, harassing the surface with a rotary tool, making weird holes, having fun with oils, and much more. I'll be working on this amusing hobby of worry tank destroyer completely out of the box. The kit itself is fairly simple with mostly straightforward instructions. I generally do mostly aircraft models, so I'm not exactly sure why I decided to film a tank as my first video for YouTube. I will be trying a lot of new and off techniques on this thing, so it should be fun. For gluing pieces together, I'm a big fan of using Mr. Cement S, as it dries much faster than uh, standard cements. Since the suspension is fully workable, I'm putting on these caps by gluing the whole thing together. To make sure this thing doesn't fall apart later on, I'm putting the tiniest amount of glue at the end of the cap. I find it pretty cool how they provide you with springs for the suspension. It does take a bit of effort to set them in place properly, but it does work just like the real thing as far as I'm aware. With this tank in particular, I'm not terribly worried if I don't think everything historically accurate since it never really existed. The Japanese did make a wooden mock-up towards the end of the war, but uh, that's about it. Now here I do a little bit of cheating. Instead of sanding all these road wheels manually, I load them up with my rotary tool and I get to work. Unfortunately, I can't do the fun stuff of these since there isn't a hole going all the way through each wheel, so I have to sand every single one manually, which uh, took quite a while. With all these moving parts, I'm pretty careful to make sure to put the glue in only one place and not let it go everywhere, so it stays spinning. I'm not a huge fan of uh, doing repetitive subassemblies, so it's kind of the reason why I stick mostly aircraft. I haven't built a kit with this much workability before, but it was quite an enjoyable process, not to mention how satisfying it is playing around with it. The instructions tell you to secure the side skirts to the lower hole first, but I decided to attach them to the upper hole. Now this caused a slight fit issue, so I had to fix it here. All I'm doing is basically cutting a styrene rod so I can place between the hull and the side skirt so when I put it to the lower hull, it doesn't work. And as you can see, no more gap between both hulls. Vision ports were an optional detail in the kit, but I thought they looked cool so I decided to add them. Now here we've got some metal footage parts for the Augsas grills. I cut these off with a sharp blade and a chunk of hard acrylic. Some people recommend using a ceramic tile, but that doesn't work too well because it dulls the blade way too quickly. I bend them into shape using uh, some pliers on my hands. For attaching them, I use simple super glue. Next up, to improve the detail of the exhaust, I drill through it with uh, my rotary tool and a carbide burr.
I use some plastic cement to soften the detail or I cut it. And as you can see, it was definitely worth the extra five minutes because the difference is pretty significant. Since I intend on weathering this thing pretty heavily, I just poke and slash with an exacto blade to add some wear to the grate. The main thing you should keep in mind when doing this kind of damage or any other really is to make sure to keep the cuts and holes random so it doesn't look consistent because then it will look pretty natural. And once again, I get to speed up the process by shoving this thing into my rotary tool and sanding all the nubs at once. Unfortunately, I have to do it manually once again on the other end of the barrel since it doesn't really have any way to shove it in the rotary tool without damaging it. And this fat armor plate is also optional, but I put it on because it also looks cool. And I get to move the gun now. And here we go, tracks, by far my least favorite part of any tank build. Fortunately, these aren't that bad, as all I have to do is snip off their attachments. And that's 20 minutes of work in 5 seconds. The tracks are also workable, but they are very fragile. You put them together by clicking them, and some of the pins uh, wear out quite easily, so they fall apart very easily. It was quite frustrating attaching them to the sprocket, as the teeth were slightly too far apart. It did sort of work out in the end, but only after failing 20 times. Somehow they did not completely fall apart when filming this, but they are extremely fragile like I said before. Next up, I'll be fitting down the plastic around the fenders with my rotary tool using carbide burrs. I'm pretty careful with this whole process and checking every 20 seconds or so against a light to see how much I have gone through so I don't completely destroy the part. The front fenders get the same treatment, and the whole reason why I'm doing this thing is so I can melt them and add battle damage and kinks and bends into the benders so they look like they've been worn and used. I recently bought a heat gun, so I'll be trying it here for the first time, so uh, don't blame me if I screw it up completely. My plan here was to heat up the plastic and then quickly use pliers to deform it. Turns out the heat on its own warps the benders pretty realistically. I still use pliers on top of this to add more variety to the bends and make it more random. Now, as I was spinning down the plastic around the fenders, I noticed it created a pretty unique texture, so I decided to test it out and apply it to the gun mantlet, which would be cast steel. Throughout this process, I used three different types of burrs to create different shapes and sizes of the dents and texture. Just in general, random movements are key to create a really nice random surface. This was the first time I tried this kind of texture and I thought it looked pretty cool. I didn't originally intend on making any of this, but because of how the gun mantle ended up, I decided to apply the same texture to the rest of the tank. I know this may not be entirely realistic, and the texture is somewhat overdone, but since this tank never really existed, I went for a bit more creative liberty here. After obliterating the entire surface, I had to rescribe some of the lines. I also redefined the flame cut marks slightly more with a simple exacto blade and then cement. 
on this tank, the rear wheels have rubber edges, which look a little too pristine, and in real life would generally get worn out. And since I'm very lazy, I do the quick way of just stabbing at them with my rotary tool. Following this, I mark the pencil spots where I want to add shell damage from tanks firing at this, more or less randomly. I did most of the carving with a smaller round burr. I use an X-Acto blade here to give a larger angle to the shot. Next up, I'll be creating the effect of metal being displaced after shell hitting it. I learned the hard way that it's important to let the putty sit there a little bit before pressing in the brush, since if it's still wet, it will stick to it. Twisting the brush also helps quite a bit. This was the first time I attempted any battle damage of this kind. And I had to redo it a bunch of times, but it came out in the end alright. Now, after all that work, I get to painting. For priming the surface, I'm using a lacquer primer, Mr. Surfacer 1500. I have a premix bottle here with Mr. Leveling Thinner, ready to go. There are a few reasons to prime our models. Primarily, it provides a good base for following paint, but it also unifies the surface and allows you to spot any imperfections. I almost exclusively use black primer in most of my models, as it provides a great base coat for appreciating, and in most cases provides great contrast, so I don't miss any spots with my actual painting. Priming the tracks is a bit more tedious as there is a greater length of them, and you have to make sure to paint each crevice. Across all parts of this tank, I'm making sure to get into every nook and cranny. It's especially more important at this stage since missing spots with future layers of paint will just look like shadows, while well, it would look rather odd with bare plastic showing through. Now I'm painting the base layer for the chipping, which is a dark gray color. I mixed this thing a while ago, so honestly I can't tell you exactly what shade it is. At this stage, I am removing the cannon as I will leave it in its base grey color. I've seen this in many late war German tanks, and it's another thing to add visual interest and contrast to the camouflage. The reason for this, historically, is because they would have changed out the barrels but being too much of a rush to paint them. Now, for the first part of the camouflage, I'll be using MRP Red Brown. Now, you might think that I just wasted my time painting in the gray, since I have nothing between the two paints. But I will be using a pretty unique weathering technique later on, so it'll all make sense soon. While the red brown color from MRP is specifically for German armor, I found it to be a pretty close match to the Japanese primer, which is also a similar reddish brown. Next up, I will be masking the camouflage. I'm using Tamiya masking tape to do this. I'll be making a splinter scheme of a red primer color. What inspired me is very late German urban splinter camouflage and this tank from World of Tanks. I really like how this fictional camouflage looked with red primer color and top of a darker brown. I decided to replicate that except for the whole tank. I don't play that game, but it does have some interesting and unique schemes. Except for that front part, I'm doing everything on the fly, so I didn't plan any of this chem ahead apart for the upper mantlet that I copied from the tank skin. When doing a camo like this, it's pretty important to make sure most of the splinter edges don't form parallels or direct perpendiculars as it will look odd in the end. 
I will be using once again this German Primer Red color from MRP on top as it contrasts the brown quite nicely. I'm spraying this top layer in lighter coats because I don't want it to react with the bottom layer as it might ruin the chipping effect I'll be trying later on. Lacquers when sprayed wet will melt the bottom layer slightly, which in most cases is not an issue, and even creates better adhesion, but here I want it to be more separate. Now the satisfying part, peeling off those sweet masks. Masking this whole thing took a solid half an hour, and I'm removing them all in about two minutes. It's pretty great seeing the entire camo coming to shape after playing these things off. Right now it looks super clean, but don't worry, I'll change that very soon. Here is where the magic comes in. You can see here in a test piece I already tried it out. I'm using alcohol to basically strip the paint to its surface. As the alcohol slowly strips the paint off the surface, if manipulated with a brush right, it will create a pretty unique wear and chipping effect. In this case, I'm using 70% IPA which I found to work pretty well in lacquers, but for less durable paints, I would recommend using stuff closer to 50% or lower. With the alcohol, I'm just slapping it on and letting it sit there for a few minutes or so until I start working with the brush. I'm just using a softer brush to twist and rub at the surface until I see chips slowly forming. You have to be pretty careful with this technique as it's easy to go overboard, and I stop the second I see chips forming. Generally, I'm applying more chips in spots where paint would wear off soonest, so parts like edges, hinges. If you just apply it to randomly over the surface, it will look a bit odd. With things like this, I like to work section by section as it allows me to have better control and doesn't force me to rush any part of the tank. This technique is somewhat similar to airspray chipping. What it does much better though is creating much finer and varied chips. The main trade-off is that it is somewhat unpredictable. How you rub the surface and what kind of brush matters too. You will get different results from stiffer and softer brushes. Another pretty important thing to keep in mind is not to touch the surface where the alcohol has been applied for at least half an hour. It softens the paint quite a bit and you will leave a big fingerprint on it if you touch it. The cool thing of alcohol is that after it dries, it leaves this dusty residue. I didn't do a single thing here additionally to create that dust effect. Unfortunately, it fades away once I put varnish over it, and I will need to do that for the effects I will be applying soon. There were a few spots where I stripped the paint to the bare plastic with the alcohol chipping. I easily fixed that with painting them in with a darker gray color. Now we get into varnish in a tank. I'm using an already pre fend bottle, super clear gloss from Mr. Color. I'm laying down a gloss varnish to make it easier and smoother to apply a wash, which I'll be doing in the next step. As you can see, this pretty quickly changes the tone of the paintwork. Here, I'll be using this lighter shade of black from MRP to cheat on the road wheels a little. I need to paint the rubber on the road wheels, and the correct way to do this would be painting all of it with a brush, as I don't risk any overspray. Since I'm lazy and I want to save time, I will be airbrushing the outside parts of the rubber and the inside with a brush. I only risk having overspray on the underside of the fenders, which won't be seen anyway. Additionally, the darker brown is more forgiving as it is not terribly contrasting with the dark rubber. Painting the insides of the roll wheels is pretty straightforward and simple, just a bit time consuming. I mix my own shade from black and the gray to match the airbrushed work. Next up, I'll be using burnt umber and black oil paints mixed with odorless thinner. I rarely mix these things by exact ratio, so after a certain time of doing this, you get a decent feel for how much to add. I'm applying this wash to most raised and recessed details. It allows for those parts to be much better visible through added contrast. It's not too big of an issue if I make it slightly messy because I'll be cleaning up the excess soon. The 
Now I'm just using this makeup sponge, a dampen and odorless thinner to clean off the excess wash. Since nearly all of the paintwork is finished at this point, I am setting the gun back in its place. To seal in the wash and to create a proper base for our following oil work, I will be using this matte varnish from VMS. Apart from sealing in the previous work, matte works as a much better base for blending oils since if I just used gloss it would spread around too easily. I will now use these oil colors to create an oil dot filter. I am spreading these on top of a piece of cardboard and letting them sit there for half an hour in order to let some of the linseed oil seep out. This makes it easier to work with and dry faster. I am spreading these dots more or less from light to dark. The purpose of the buff oil color is to create light dust streaks, while the ochres and browns are to create a filter as well as to vary the camouflage more. These colors will make the surface much more vibrant. Once those are applied, I'm streaking the dots up and down with a brush, just barely dampened with autoless spirit. It is important not to use too much since then you will completely wipe off the oils. Horizontal surfaces get pretty much the same application, although I am stippling the brush instead of streaking. After being finished with the oil dot filter, I applied a light coat of the same matte varnish to seal it in. While the filter didn't add a lot of depth, I will now be using this black oil paint to create artificial shadows and contrast. This will make it even more visually interesting. I'm applying the black oil paint straight out of the tube and then blending it with a different brush moistened with utterly spirits. While blending, I like working slowly from the outside and pushing the paint in so I can get somewhat of a gradient. Applying this pretty much everywhere where a shadow could form or you have panel lines meeting. I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to apply the same black gradient on the bottom of the hull, but I'm glad I did, as it adds some nice contrast between the two hulls. While working with this and blending, I'm taking my time and doing multiple passes, stippling my brush on the surface. Doing this helps outline the ship's attack more and adds a lot of visual interest. Now I'll be painting the tracks with these life color acrylic paints. I'm loosely following Nietzsche's tutorial, so check that out for a much better idea. This video is pretty great. This will be my first time using these paints. I may not get it perfect. I'm just spinning these and slapping them on. Nothing more to it. I'll be working my way from light to dark to create a nice rusty effect. So far it's just yellow. As the paint dries, the links lock up, so I have to bend them individually to undo that. I'm stippling the third color just with a brush to create more variation in the shade. I wasn't terribly happy at this point, so I decided to apply a wash onto it. I'm using the exact same wash as I applied earlier on the tank. They look much more presentable. I painted the exhaust as random brown color, but unfortunately I lost the footage, so you'll have to just imagine it for yourself. 
I'll be applying rust to the exhaust as well, and the way I'll be doing it is with pigment. I'm just mixing this dark brown pigment with VMS Pigment Binder into a light wash. And this will be my base layer, I just brush it on loosely on the entire surface of the exhaust. I then take a lighter shade of rust and stipple it on loosely, not covering the whole surface, but more or less randomly. That a lighter rust pigment, stippling out even less, but just to create some variation, and once it dries it should look pretty good. I like this method because it not only creates visual but also physical texture, plus it's pretty fast. To fix this into place I'm using medium thickness super glue. And yes, I now have Cheeto fingers from the rust pigment. Now it's time to add some exhaust stains. Similar to the contrast thing I did earlier, I'm just applying black wall paint, although this time I'm applying it on its own without blending it using additional means. Overall blending it and giving it a faded look isn't terribly difficult, you just put more oil paint in the middle and less on the outside to make it faded. And since I already got it out, I'm just using it to add some additional shadows to the exhaust. Now I'll be creating the polish track effect, and the application is slightly similar to the pigment I used earlier. I use the same VMS binder and brush it on. The cool thing with this one is it can be completely polished with a cotton swab, making it quite shiny and perfect for polished tracks, as it is dark depending on the angle you look at. For the underside of the track, I'm polishing where road wheels would meet and grind up the surface, creating a polished look. Nice and shiny. Brockets teeth also get polished since they grind away at the track constantly. more shiny. Now it's time to put the tracks on the tank, which was a complete nightmare. As I mentioned a while ago, these are very fragile, and while I may not show it in the video, I spent two hours working on these, and they are quite frustrating. The moment I connect one piece, another would fall apart, so that's basically how it looked. I'd still say it was worth the effort, since I'll be able to put in a diorama now, if I want to. In place of a bullet and shell markings, the paint and primer obviously completely stripped off, so it'll look like bare metal, that's why I'm applying the polished metal effect here. I also apply it to edges, hinges, nuts, exposed details, anything that could scrape off or get worn out more easily. And with these final touches, this thing is nearly finished. I'm Matt from Kerberos Models, and thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate leaving a like and subscribing. If you got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer any of them in the comments.